I'm thankful that I can be with you and with my friend, Danny Aiken. As I think about your president, Aiken, I think of the old account of the man who was on a hill wearying of the battle and then looked on a distant hill and saw another friend still fighting. And I think of Danny Aiken, I think. There's a friend who, even as I looked at his Christ-centered exposition of Jude today, a friend who is in the same battle for the gospel in all the scriptures and for all the world. Let me tell you, as you may be just wondering who this fellow is up here and why he would talk about things like Christ-centered exposition, why it is important to me. My, my goal for this lecture today is just to have some definition of what Christ-centered preaching is, and then because I know those are the issues of debate that are often separated from pastoral ministry, on Thursday to talk about why Christ-centered exposition, not just for a correct interpretation, but for the difference it makes in pastoral ministry that is dedicated to spiritual transformation, because the two are connected, and I want to make sure that we have time in both. For today, why is Christ-centered exposition important to me? I'll just start this way. When I graduated from seminary, I had a I had a great privilege, and the privilege was even as a, a young person, I was asked to take the pastorate of what was the oldest and the largest of our churches in our region. And how do I say this to you? Young guy, right out of seminary, asked to take the pastorate of the oldest and largest of our churches in our region. I thought I was hot stuff. I mean, look at me. Young guy, this church, I'm flying high. And I must tell you, I flew high for a little bit, but had no idea, ultimately, how hard it was going to be. And it wasn't just because I was out of my depth, young guy in a large and historic church. It was because of what began to happen in that church. In our region, the main industry was coal mining. And with all about six months of my coming to that church, the Environmental Protection Agency changed the standards for coal that could be marketed in the United States. In our region, the coal was soft, high sulfur coal. And it was ruled illegal to be marketed anymore in the United States. Within just a few months of my arrival in that community, we had quite literally thousands of people out of work in the six counties surrounding our church. One mine after another began to close. And while there was a social safety net for a lot of those people, I must tell you that for a pastor, it was hell. I mean, you can just imagine if, if jobs and income are declining very rapidly outside the home, you can already imagine what kind of dynamics are rising just as rapidly inside the home and inside the church. If jobs and income are declining rapidly, what's going on in people's homes? Stress, conflict, abuse, addiction. People will medicate any way they can adultery, and depression everywhere. Like a blanket over the community, like a blanket in our church, depression everywhere. Now, as I faced a church of people struggling with abuse and adultery, addictions and depression, because I'd been to seminary, I knew exactly what to do. You ought to laugh. I thought I knew what to do. I would open my Bible every week in the pulpit, and I would say to people who were struggling with things like addiction these wonderful words. Stop it. Now, just stop it. It says right here in the Bible, you shall not be drunk on much wine. Now, you just stop it. And the Bible says here that you should love your wife as Christ loves the church. You may not hit her. Stop it. And those of you struggling with depression, rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again. Rejoice. Stop it. 
I said, stop it so often. I could not stand me anymore. I said to my wife one day, I did not go to seminary to learn to hurt people. But I stand in the pulpit every Sunday, and I hurt people. And I can't do this anymore. And we really did make that call to my wife's parents to say, we may be coming to live with you, because I don't know what I'm going to do for a living, but I can't do this anymore. At something of a low point in that time in my life, the Lord brought across my awareness, I don't even remember how anymore, a book by a man named Sidney Gradanus, who was examining a controversy in the Dutch church a hundred years previous. <laughs> you think, how is this going to help? A controversy in the Dutch church a hundred years ago. But here was the controversy. How do we preach the heroes of the Bible? Now, you've been to Sunday school. You know how you preach the heroes of the Bible. You look at somebody like David. You know, he went up and beat up the lion and the bear. And when he was a young man, he faced Goliath. And Goliath says to him, am I a dog that you come against me with a sling? And David said, you come with sword, javelin, and spear. I come in the name of the Lord. And if you have enough faith, you can be like David. You should just be like David. We know how to preach it. Well, except for that chapter about Bathsheba (laughs) and how he murdered her husband to have her and then raised bad kids and then at the end of his life numbered his troops to claim his own glory rather than give God glory. What Sidney Gradanus did as he began to examine the heroes of the Bible is slowly and methodically began to demythologize the heroes, to desanitize the Sunday school descriptions, and to come up with one very clear understanding that was simply this. There's only one true hero in the Bible. Who is that? That is Jesus. And as obvious as that may be to me now, I will tell you it was revolutionary to me then. Because what it meant was that Bible is not just full of the sanitized heroes to tell us to be like. In fact, what the Bible is saying over and over again in a thousand ways is if God could use and bless people as messed up as those in the Bible, maybe there's still hope for us. And I could look at people who were struggling with addiction and abuse and marriage is breaking up, and depression, and say to them, if God could use those as messed up as those in the Bible, maybe there's still hope for you. And I began to see a light of hope come in people's eyes again. But it wasn't just those people who needed hope again. Who else needed to know that God could still use people who had messed up? Who else needed that message? I was not even out of my 20s, and I believed that I was a failure and was leaving the ministry. And to learn that the Bible that I thought I loved was saying, as messed up as you may be and as much of a mess as you may have made, God still has a purpose for you. It was hope, and it was blessing, and I discerned This is the gospel not only that I want to preach, this is the gospel that is spread from the Scriptures from first page to last, if we will but learn to see it. My goal is to go very quickly today and tell you how do we learn to see it, that gospel in all the Scriptures. If you take the big storyline, not news to you, but maybe just news how you would use it, and you say, what is the storyline of the Bible if you draw it out? Clear enough, you start with creation in which God made everything good. Didn't last very long. Pretty soon there's a fall in which everything (laughs) went bad. That's not the end of the story. You know where it's going. Way over here at the other end of the consummation of all things, God makes everything perfect, which, by the way, is even better than good. But what happens in the meantime? 
I mean, what is the rest of the biblical record about? You recognize from the very beginning, God is declaring what he is going to do. After all, we have way up here after the fall, that Genesis 3.15, where God, as it were, declares the theme of the rest of the scriptures. God actually addresses Satan and says, I am going to put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, and he is going to have his heel struck by you, Satan. But what is he going to do to you, Satan? He is going to crush your head. And that proto-evangelium, that first gospel, is the declaration that it is at this point game on. That God is at this point saying, I will bring about a redemption of a fallen world and a messed up people. And that redemption is ultimately going to happen as the seed of the woman comes And by the plan of God, will not only crush the head of Satan, he will rise and ascend and rule. And that is what ultimately is going to lead to the consummation that was promised from the very beginning. What God has said is, this is not random. This is not an occasional moral tale interspersed by a command. This is a a purposed, progressive, intentional unfolding of a message of grace that culminates in the work of Jesus Christ. And when we learn to see that, we don't read the Bible as a a disconnected collection of Aesop's fables. We don't recognize it to be just a bunch of moral propositions that good people follow in order to make themselves acceptable to God. Rather, what we are perceiving is that God has said, from the beginning, I am coming to the rescue. And that understanding that God is coming to the rescue says God is the hero that is operating. He is the one who moves over all things to help people achieve his purposes when they were totally incapable or undeserving. What it does is it changes the agenda for our preaching. If I am actually going to say what the text says, if that's my exposition, I'm going to say what the text says, then I'm obligated, as I always am, to remember context is part of the text. And the context of all the texts in the biblical record is what Jesus himself declared. Remember? After the resurrection, on the road to Emmaus, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, He revealed what was said in all the scriptures, the things what? Concerning himself. Now, does that mean that every verse mentions Jesus? Please say no. It does not mean that every verse or every chapter mentions Jesus. It does mean that there is an unfolding revelation, not just of the provision of God's grace, but of the necessity of God's grace human fallenness on display, which is not its own solution. What that means is, if all that I do as I approach my preaching is I'm thinking, here's my, here's my job today. I, I need to make clear to God's people what I think of as the D and the D, their duty and or their doctrine. My goal today is to increase your competence in biblical doctrine or increase your duty in biblical obligation. Now, I'm not saying those are unnecessary things. Those are necessary things. I will tell you at the same time, they are insufficient. If my only goal is to increase your competence or to increase your performance, if that's my only goal, increase your competence or increase your performance, who is your redeemer? You are. You just have to increase your competence or just to increase your performance. Now, you think, oh, no, no, I would, never, I would never put that down on an exam. I know, we would never put it down on an exam. But it easily comes into our teaching, our thinking, our way of approaching people. In a uh, more famous appendix to a fairly famous books, it's a book, uh, Rush Dooney has what he talks about as the, the menace of the Sunday school. Here I am in Southern Baptist circles talking about the menace of the Sunday school. 
Do you know what Rush Dooney said was the menace of the Sunday school? He said it's, it's the sweet-sounding and well-intended Sunday school teacher who speaks to a little girl and says, oh, Sally, if you're just a good little girl, Jesus will love you. It sounds so sweet, and it is spiritual poison. If you are just a good little girl, Jesus will love you. That is what we would say every other religion in the world teaches. You get good enough for your God. What do we say Christianity alone teaches? Not that we would reach to him, but what? He reached to us. God will not love Sally because she's a good little girl. Her best works are only filthy rags to him. Jesus said, Luke 17, 10, when you have done everything that you should do, you are still an unworthy servant before God. Wait, wait. If you've done everything that you should do, you are, now who qualifies there? And yet Jesus, even if you qualified there, it would still not make you acceptable to the holy king of the universe. Who makes you acceptable to God? God does. Not the perfections of your competence, not the perfections of your performance, but the perfections of Christ and Christ alone. We sing it, but it somehow escapes our preaching because what we end up doing with good intention is we focus on a text and we look either at the doctrine or the duty that's there and we make the entirety of our message the duty or the doctrine, which are necessary, which are right, which are good, but insufficient. What has to be added to the equation is what is always added to the equation. What is the context of the text? Where are we in the unfolding message of redemption? Here's the reality. If God is coming to the rescue, there has to be a problem. What I have identified in my works as a fallen condition focus. There is, there is some problem that is being addressed. If God is coming to the rescue, there is an issue that is being addressed. People say, you can't just talk about grace in every sermon. You know, that gets old. I say, well, you don't say the, the contrary. You say, we can't talk about the law in every sermon. That will just get old. No, you say, no, there are so many dimensions to our competence and our performance. And I'll say, there are so many dimensions to the grace of God as is addressing aspects of our fallenness. Why, why is God going through thousands of years to express to us the unfolding plan of his redemption? Because we're complicated creatures. There are dimensions of fall in us that we have to understand so that we can properly repent and go to a redeemer. And, and those dimensions of our fallenness help us to understand that, that when we look at people, we ought to see Swiss cheese. They got holes in them. There's no temptation taken you but such as is common. What, what does that mean? There was a time in my life in which I thought that meant that, that if I'm struggling with something, I, I take encouragement by the fact that somebody out there, maybe a lot of people out there, are also struggling with that thing. I do not believe that's what that verse means anymore. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, there's no temptation taking you but such as is common, which means there is nothing going on out there the seeds of which are not already in here. How do I know that's true? James said, if you've broken one command, how many have you actually broken? All of them. When we look at people, we ought to see people who are morally unholy. And if they have holes in them, in their holiness, what is going to fill the holes? Well, you just straighten up. You just do better. You know more. You have doctrine better than the guy down the street. You perform better than you did yesterday. If what is filling the holes is human competence or human performance, you are your redeemer. But you cannot fix yourself any more than a man with dirty hands can clean a white shirt. You are not your own redeemer. 
The reason that God is revealing the fallenness of humanity is because there is an unfolding message of the grace of God that's getting larger and larger and larger and culminating in the person and the work of Christ. And if I am perceiving that, I begin to understand it is insufficient to tell fallen people, you just fix yourself. You just do better than you did. And despite that, you have to recognize there are very common ways that we can preach because we're trying to be fair to the text. We're trying to say what it says, but we end up with remarkably human-centered rather than Christ-centered messages. It, It happens so simply and with the best of intention. Let me show you how. There are messages that come very readily to us that fail to take into account the context of the text. One of those very familiar messages is what I will call be like messages. I look at some portion of the biblical text and identify a biblical character and I say, you should be like that person. Now, it's it's very common in evangelical circles. You must know that. It's actually got a name in the history of preaching. This is known as biographical preaching. Okay? We look at a person, we say, you should be like that person. Now, you know there's a problem with David already, right? Got it. You know, I I can't just say, be like David. But now, you know, there are good guys in the Bible. I mean, Abraham, now, you know, there… There's somebody, you know, I mean, he, he went to the land he did not know to obey the call of God. He abandoned father and friends and wealth, and he obeyed the call of God to go to the land he did not know. And, and on that journey, he only gave away his wife twice to other men. And, and then because he did not have patience for the Lord's promise of a child, He slept with his wife's maid. And then, of all things, his wife got upset about that. He took his biological son and his mistress, and he put them to die in the desert of exposure. Well, maybe you shouldn't be like Abraham either. But now Barnabas... Now, that's the New Testament, so this this has to be a good guy. You know, Barnabas was a great encourager of God's people. Why, his very name means encouragement. I mean, he he took all that extra effort to, with courage, go with Paul on that early missionary journey. You know, you should should be like Barnabas. Now, there, there is a problem there, too. After all, ultimately, Barnabas had a falling out with Paul on whether John Mark should accompany them on the next missionary journey. And he was not an encourager at all. If we will take care not to sanitize the accounts, we will recognize that God is teaching us something. Everybody in the Scriptures needs somebody other than themselves to rescue them from themselves. It's not enough just to say, be like. Now, you have to hear me say it clearly. These are not wrong messages in themselves. These are not wrong messages in themselves. We truly are meant to learn good things from the good character of biblical characters. We're also supposed to learn they were not entirely good. (laughs) They were not holy. The biblical characters function like the commandments, like the law. That is, it is necessary to learn what to do as a consequence of their character. But it is absolutely deadly to base our spiritual status with God on being like them. Christ and Christ alone makes us right with God. Now, I will grant you, I will grant you that that there are some biblical characters that appear to be entirely good as far as we know. Right? I mean, what does it say about Enoch in the Bible? Anybody remember? Enoch walked with God and he was no more. And you just can't get much dirt in there. I mean, that's just all it says. He walked with God and he was no more. And Caleb and Jonathan. I hope you recognize not only that there is not a lot said about these persons' lives, 
But even theologically, if we were to say they are right before God, theologically, who enabled that? That was God too. God was still coming to the rescue. Simply to look at a biblical character and make the entire message, you should just be like that person, is not wrong in itself. It is wrong by itself. If that's the entirety of the message, that's where its flaw is. Not that there are not important things to learn, but we are to learn they needed a rescue. And if that doesn't work its way into the message, we have not understood the context. Now, if you think that is kind of against tradition, recognize the next form of messages that become rather deadly, because we're just telling people to be something, are messages that are entirely be good. You should just be good. Now, you think, well, what could be wrong with that? You certainly don't want to preach the opposite. Be bad. No, what's wrong with be good messages? Girl Scouts are good. Boy Scouts are good. Christians are good. It's good to be good. It's bad to be bad. So be good. Your best works are only what to God? Filthy rags. When you've done all that you should do, you're what kind of servant? unworthy servant. Do you recognize even in the church, perhaps most people are out there balancing scales? Well, you know, I'm not perfect. I'm not perfect. But, you know, the good stuff outweighs the bad stuff. What if they truly understood your best works go on the wrong side of the scale? They actually will bring you into judgment before a holy God. There is too much taint of your humanity in your best works to make them acceptable to a holy God. And therefore, if all I have said in the sermon is, be good, I lead you to your condemnation. Because all you have to present to God is your goodness against his holy perfections. Now, believe me, I'm not saying be bad. I'm not saying this is a wrong message in itself. I am not saying that. I'm saying this is a wrong message. Can you complete? This is a wrong message, not in itself, but by itself. If that is the entirety of the message, if I just tell people, you just be good, what do they think makes them acceptable to God? Their performance. He said, well, no, no, no. I'm going to get around to the evangelistic sermon in which I make sure it's Christ's work, and we're going to do that, and let's see. Five weeks till the evangelistic sermon, and then I'll tell them it's Jesus. Or I'll tell them it's works that they have to do, and, and you know, uh, next week we'll, we'll get to Christ. You will discern something if you counsel or parent or preach very quickly. Even when you preach grace, people hear law. Every relationship in their life is contractual, right? You do something, you get something. Whether you're in business, many people in their marriages these days, right, they don't take out a marriage covenant, they take out a marriage contract. I will love you as long as you please me. And people intuitively hear that. In the day and age in which we live, in which so many more people live together for a while to find out if you're acceptable to me before I'm going to commit to you, it's a contract. You prove your acceptance, and, and then we'll decide whether or not we're going to be, and then we'll maintain this marriage as long as we're acceptable to one another. Whether it's relationships or occupation or business deals, what, whatever it is, it's all contractual. And if we only tell people, you just be good, and God love you for that, they actually hear what they believe is right from the Bible. You should know it's wrong, that, that every other way in which the Bible is teaching us is saying, this is covenant, this is a God who is making a commitment to you on the basis of his mercy. When the kindness and mercy of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us, not on the basis of the good works that we have done, but according to his mercy, not based on what I do. Not, that's not just true of my entry into the kingdom, that is true of every day of my life. 
I am right with God based upon his mercy, not my goodness. My goodness is a response to his grace. It is never a purchase of it. It is living in love according to the one who has loved me. And if the entirety of my message is just be good, the human instinct just takes over. And it says, oh, so that's, wh- that's, how, that's why God will love me, because I got good enough. Now, the good enough sets up the last major problem of what I call these deadly bees that are so common in our preaching. The last of the deadly bees is the most common. It is the messages that are entirely be more disciplined. Be more disciplined. Pray more, better, higher, longer, darker closet. (laughs) Read your Bible more. Longer chapters, through the Bible in a year plan, or three times in a year plan, or just do more. You know you're supposed to read your Bible, so get up earlier, do it longer, do it deeper, more research tools, just, just do more. And by the way, while you're doing all that, go to church more. You should go to church more, especially you should go to my church more. What's wrong with the more messages? There is no bottom to that pit. How much more? How many more filthy rags does he need before he's satisfied? No. If God is going to be your God because of your performance, you will never get there. If God is going to love you because you have done enough Bible reading, praying, going to, you will never do enough. You, you may not be in settings, so in my particular setting right now, we, we are surrounded by Anabaptist communities, so that's semi-Pelagian. And the, the true sense is that, that you have to do enough to make yourself acceptable to God. And so many of the people who come to our church and they begin to hear a message of, of God's grace is what claims you, not, not your performance. I mean, it is such a common story. We hear it over and over again of people say, when I was growing up, my mom or dad would send me back to my room for any poor behavior, and they would say, you haven't repented enough yet. You haven't cried enough yet. You haven't felt bad enough, long enough yet. In which case, what, what they had to perceive is even their repentance was going to be measured by their discipline of repentance. Have I cried enough tears? Have, have, have I felt bad enough, long? Am I miserable enough to really be okay to God? Listen, if, if God is being satisfied by your misery, what are you implicitly saying about the blood of Christ? It is not sufficient. I'm not okay with God based on the blood of Christ. I am okay with God based upon my human misery. You will meet over and over again in your bastards, in your counseling sessions, in your parenting, People who believe that God will not be happy with them until they are miserable enough with themselves. That the mark of their orthodoxy, the mark of their acceptance is that they are unhappy and sad. Who after all is it that wants you to try to serve God with a huge burden of guilt upon your back? Who wants you to serve God with a huge burden of guilt and unhappiness? Who wants you to do that? That is Satan. That is the accuser of the brethren. Because he knows that that if you will just take that load of guilt and shame and keep it or believe you compensate for it by your disciplines, that you will remain crushed by your own understanding of a holy God, who he is and what he requires. There is a grace of God that is unfolding in all the scriptures. And we need to understand it so that we will preach with the context that lets us preach all of these things. Be like, be good, be more disciplined, but as a response to grace, not as a way of brokering it, not not as a way of earning it, not as a bribe, but as a reception of the bread that we have been given 
by the grace of God. How is that grace of God on display in all the Scriptures? There are different ways in which this ministry of Christ is being made known. And here in a brief chapel period, there's no way I can get into all the debates that you know happen about proper ways of doing Christ-centered preaching, but quick things. No, almost nobody disagrees that one way in which Christ is talking about himself being revealed in all the Scriptures is there are clearly some Old Testament passages that are predictive of the work of Christ. I mean, that, that's not hard. We understand sometimes Christ gets on the page before he has gotten on earth by the predictions about him that are coming. Prophecies that occur in the Mosaic books, right? Like Deuteronomy 18, like Genesis 3.15. In the historical books, like David being promised an eternal and universal kingdom in 2 Samuel. We recognize that there are messianic psalms in the wisdom books. We, we recognize major prophets, minor prophets talk about the coming redeemer. There are prophecies throughout the Old Testament that are predicting the coming work of Christ. There's a context of God's redemption that's being unfolded by saying, wherever we are in the Old Testament here, it's not the final chapter. There's someone still coming to fulfill what God said would happen in the Proto-Evangelium, the first gospel. Those are not the debated things. What we have to recognize is there's another way in which the Bible, in its unfolding, is making clear the necessity of the coming Redeemer, and that is by passages that are preparatory. They are preparing us for the work of Christ. Now, these come in two categories, and a real quick thumbnail here. Some passages are bridges. They're bridging our understanding. So we have things like prophets, priests, and kings in the Old Testament. Why is that important for you? Because you begin to understand there is a coming one who will be prophet, priest, and king. And when he's actually described as those things in the New Testament, you would not know what they meant if you had not been prepared Christ is our Passover. How do you know what that means? You've been prepared. A, a bridging of your understanding from the sacrificial systems, from the sacrificial animals, from that which was insufficient but necessary for the one who is necessary and sufficient. You've been prepared. What we don't often think about is there are also ways that we are being prepared by dead ends. Let me do that again. By dead ends. There are things that do not work. In the period of the judges, everyone did what? Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Now, you need to remember that's the background. Everyone does what's right in their own eyes. How'd that work out for them? That don't work. <laughs> How do you know? Well, you know, there's this story about Samson. And you know, when Samson had long hair, he was strong. And when he had short hair, he was weak. Therefore, you should have... Say it, Danny. Therefore, you should... I'm sorry. Certain people are going to be a little more limited in obeying this command than other people. <laughs> now, you know that's not what it means. What does it mean? Why do we have the story of Samson? So that you'll be told, you know, not to marry attractive women? So that you'll be told to get long hair? I mean, wh why do... Samson was very strong. He was very clever. And that did not save him. It does not matter how strong you are. It does not matter how clever you are. Somebody's going to have to rescue you and your people, and it's not you. You are not your Redeemer. And that is true of virtually every judge that we are told. What do you know about Gideon? Wow, there's a great guy. Took 300 soldiers up against 135,000 Midianites and got a victory. Now, there's somebody you ought to try to be like. By the way, what did Gideon do with the gold from the victory of the, over the 135,000 Midianites? What did he do with that gold? 
you're saying it on your lips. Like, he made an idol. Well, yeah, man, if only God had known he was going to do that. I, God knew. God knew that Gideon was not his own redeemer. God knew that Gideon was not the redeemer of his people. God knew that Gideon was a dead end. That somebody greater than Gideon, somebody else would have to rescue people. Do you recognize God takes so much time developing a book that is far more Eastern than what we Westerners like? We want to say, hey, just give me a systematics book, will you? Not a Bible. I mean, just tell me, do we baptize the babies or don't we? (laughs) Just, well, I know you think you know. (laughs) We want to go A, B, C, D, conclusion. Just, Just do it that way. But what the Bible is doing so often is saying, you have to understand what doesn't work. Not your wisdom, not your cleverness. Look, I'll I'll give you the law so you can follow it. Oh, you don't follow? Well, I'll give you sacrifices. Oh, you don't do them. In fact, the priests steal your sacrifice. Well, you need better priests. Well, okay, well, just do what's right in your own eyes. Oh, the judges don't work. Well, I'll give you kings. Well, that doesn't work either. Well, I'll give prophets so they'll tell kings what to do, and then the kings will rule justly. One little problem, the people kill the prophets. You know what? We're going to need a better law keeper. We're going to need a better sacrifice, better priest, better prophet, better king. God spends 1,500 years saying, not this, not this, not this, not this, not this, but this. So that when he comes, we understand who he is and what he must do. He has been revealed to us as as the dead ends are shown to be lifeless, without hope, but pointing toward the one true hope. That is what is being revealed to us. Sometimes we learn to see it if we will just learn to see that certain passages are reflective, and we're not looking for where does it mention Jesus, not the point. Where is it reflecting the gracious nature of God? So I begin to understand the God who is coming to the rescue. I understand who he is and what he must do. So, so Elijah, you know, he, he comes down the mountain from the great victory over the prophets of Baal, and Jezebel says, I'm going to get you for killing my priest. And what does the great prophet who's just had the great victory, what does he do? He runs away into the desert to hide. You know, God ought to just abandon him and forget him. But what does God do? For the cowardly prophet, he gives him sustenance in the desert that he can neither gain nor earn or provide for himself. I'd like for you just to learn a little phrase here. So often we will be helped when we're reading the Old Testament by saying, how is God providing for people who cannot provide for themselves. I'm not trying to make Jesus magically appear. You know, a book title can get you in trouble. Christ-centered preaching. People think I'm going to try to make you take out your magic wand or your decoder ring and get Jesus mentioned in every verse of the Bible. No way. I am saying grace is unfolding in all the Bible. God is unfolding how he must provide for people who cannot provide for themselves so that we ultimately are looking for the culmination of that message. There is a pointing to, a preparation of, a way in which God's grace is being reflected when he gives food to the hungry, when he gives pardon to the sinful, when he gives strength to the weary, when he gives rest to people who are totally worn out. Over and over again, God is saying, this is my nature. And by the way, this is your nature. You are someone who needs God. You are irretrievably, hopelessly human apart from the hope that is in Christ. After all, what does Paul say way over here in Romans 15, 4? Everything that was written in the past. I mean, what a comprehensive statement. Everything that was written in the past was written for us so that through endurance and the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. Is the hope in you? 
your performance or your competence? No. But everything was written in the, that was written in the past was written for us so that we would have hope that we would recognize the bridges, recognize the dead ends, and ultimately we would live in response, which means there are also certain passages that are resultant to the work of Jesus Christ. When we get to this side of the cross in particularly, we recognize all those, those New Testament epistles, whether it's John or Peter or Paul, I mean, there's, there's, there's kind of a standard pattern. You know it. What's happening in the first half of the epistles? What, what universally is happening in the first half of the epistles? God is telling us what he has done in Christ. Now, what's the second half of the epistle? How you respond. But there is an order there. Did you hear it? you are acting as a result of what Christ has accomplished. Did you hear that? You are acting as a result of what Christ has accomplished. As a result of what he has done, we live for him. Now, one, two, three, four, I must tell you, the debates in biblical theology are much more complicated than one, two, three, four. But what I find when I teach various people all the ways in which biblical theology is being done in the current situation, I, I find students kind of, kind of well, that, that's kind of nice, but you know, I gotta preach this week <laughs> from this passage? And, and you're telling me that I gotta figure out whether it's predictive or, or whether it's reflective or resultant? Yeah, goodness. And so I'll tell you how I think you can simplify this and do it every time in every passage without feeling that you are sacrificing any of your biblical exegesis and fairness to the text. You look at the text and you simply say, what is this text telling me about the nature of God who provides redemption? Now, that, that is a fair question of any text in the Bible. What does that tell me about God? Uh, uh, you know, that's not importing the New Testament and the Old. That, that is not requiring you to undo the interpretation of the biblical writer. You say, what does that tell me about God? Second question. What does that text tell me about humanity? What does that text tell me about me? Because there's no temptation taking me but such as is common. If I will put on those gospel glasses when I look at any text and say, was it telling me about God? Was it telling me about me? I'm going to determine that there is a God who comes to the rescue, and there are people who need rescuing. That is going to be there. Is it going to be the full message of the atonement? No, it's not going to be the full message of the atonement so many times. But it's going to be a pointer. It's going to be something saying, oh, there is a God who provides redemption, and there are people who need it. And when we see that is the unfolding message, it's going to change us. What's the response? Next time we'll talk about it. Quick way of thinking about it. 1601, Michelangelo Caravaggio paints what becomes one of the most famous and revolutionary paintings of all time, the Supper at Emmaus. Now, you remember already what happened on the road to Emmaus. Jesus, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, revealed what was said in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. But the disciples, for reasons we don't quite understand, (laughs) did not recognize him until they have supper with him. And then Jesus does something remarkably Christ-like, and they recognize him. What does he do? He breaks the bread. And in the breaking of the bread, they say, it's him. It's the fulfillment of the ages. It's the desire of nations. He is the one of whom we have heard all through our history. He's here. He's now. He's come. And to paint that moment like it's a snapshot, Caravaggio breaks all the conventions of the period. Neither Jesus nor his disciples have halos. They they, they don't have beards like aristocrats. They're, They're clean shaven so they can wash off the sawdust and the fish guts. They just look like commoners. But, but beyond that, they are not kind of sitting back in glassy-eyed, aware, oh, it's Jesus. 
Instead, they say, if this is the one long prophesied, the one who is our rescue is here, they are rising from their seats, their muscles taut. They're, they are trying to say, we must praise him. One actually tries to reach toward you as the onlooker and pull you into contact with Jesus, as if to say, if he has come, if the grace has been fulfilled, we must do something about this. We must tell people about this. And that is our task too. If the grace has come, then we declare it for a purpose. There's a life to live now and people to tell. And we'll talk about that next time. Father, would you teach us of the wonder and the goodness and the pervasiveness of your grace so that when our hearts cry out, does he care, does he love us? The unquestioning response of your word and we pray from our own hearts will be, how dearly has he loved. It was a relentless grace Help us to know it and proclaim it for the good of your people who would live in the hope that you offer. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.